Are markets around the world due for some short-term weakness? That's the question we will be answering in today's daily recap show. Stocks are starting to look exhausted. The S&P 500 just printed a shooting star doji and often what does precede this is a bit of a pullback. So where are the key levels we should be looking at and will this pullback turn into something much more sinister? Today, we're going to discuss that and the economy. Certain charts are looking really, really grim. And while the headline figures may look good, what's happening under the hood is something that we definitely need to be aware of. Also, we can't forget earnings. We had some big names report today. There were some losers and there were some losers. Could earnings finally be turning in the favor of the bears? We got a lot to talk about. So let's roll the tape. Welcome everybody to the Daily Recap Show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm. It really, really helps me out. Let's get into it. Not an amazing day here for big tech or semiconductors, but a pretty good day for the broad market as a whole. Guys, look at industrials, real estate, utilities, basic materials, all green across the board, including healthcare, including staples. We actually saw comp services put out a really good day as well, led by Google here and Meta. Netflix up 1.51% there. Disney down 9%. We're going to talk about the earnings a little later. Again, we also saw financials put out a really good day. It was really just, you know, a couple of sectors that had earnings reports that didn't do too well, as well as just the semiconductor complex and then Microsoft and Apple. And semiconductors had to do with Apple news. You know, Apple were thinking of getting into the data space for AI for their products. And the market probably looks at that as them entering to a space that they've been very successful in. Look at the M1, M2, M3 chips. In just a couple of years, they managed to beat the performance here of Intel's i5, i7 chips. And so Apple getting into this space with the amount of cash they have, the R&D spend they have, you know, semiconductors showing a bit to the downside and that's really how markets operates but you know a lot of this is just a very very short-term stuff that i think most semiconductors will brush off because apple have a long way to go in that space nonetheless a very green day across the board so the best performing sector here today was xlb followed by xlu xlp xlre real estate and then healthcare so quite a number of defensive sectors here as well as you know rate sensitive sectors and then the material sector so there wasn't really any leader but what you could say that there was a push into these defensive of sectors. Now we saw this towards the end of the day as well as at the start of the day. So I wouldn't say it's a defensive rotation. I would say that it was just a risk on trade and get into other sectors that have been lagging in the last three to four days, or at least in this bounce we've seen in the S&P 500. We saw the worst performing sectors being home construction. And again, very weird to see this divergence against real estate. And that does tell me that, you know, we are rotating more than we are just trying to get into defensive positions or positions that's going to help with, you know, the inflation narrative or undervalued um, sectors. We also saw uh, semiconductors down 0.87%, same here with discretionary software and tech. So, you know, a lot of the bigger names, the larger cap names, the mega cap names in here. So they got sold off and that's because they, they were the leaders of the pack. They really led this uh, bounce we saw after this 5% pullback. And then we also had stuff like KRE, GDX lose ever so slightly on the day, as well as energy. And this is what this tells me right here. You see GDX down 0.12% with XLB up. GDX is part of the material sector. So, so again, this tells me a bit of divergence happening and less of a risk off trade and more of just a rotation because GDX has done very well in the last 46 weeks. And again, same here with uh, KRE relative to the XLRE. So, you know, I wouldn't take anything away from here today. I mean, we would really start to get worried if we do really start to see staples, healthcare and utilities really pull away from the broader market. Then we can start asking the question, why is the market getting defensive? But as it is right now, I just see this as purely a risk on trade by equities by the laggards of the last three to five days. All right, guys, we're going to dive a bit into the charts. So firstly, the S&P 500 up 0.13% here for the day. A very average day with the Nasdaq down ever so slightly, pretty much flat. Dow Jones virtually flat as well. The RSP did gain. That's a pretty big gain. Not seeing any after hours trade here for any of these, except for the IWM, which was up 0.22%, but getting caught off guard here in extended hours. But the S&P 600 up 0.19%. Same here with mid caps, which is really the, the mega caps that didn't really perform. I mean, Apple and Google did, the others didn't, and that did like hinder the NASDAQ, but not necessarily the broader market as a whole. We saw value outperformed growth and bonds were bid up on the day today. You know, the bond trade I gave you guys on the weekend video is probably up two to three percent uh, right now. TLT up 0.61 percent here, AGG up 0.21 percent, and that's because yields are coming down. And I do firmly believe that yields are probably at the top of their range or very near the top of their range for this year, by the way, guys, I do think that we're actually going to see downward pressure on yields, uh, you know, and a lot of the market had discounted the fact that we may even get a rate hike in. 
So we moved from one point of the spectrum where we were putting in seven cuts in January, and we've moved all the way to the other spectrum where at one point people were looking at maybe we actually get a hike. I think the market went too far too fast on both ends of the spectrum. Now we have to come a bit down. I think anywhere from one to two, potentially three cuts for the year is looking very good, but one to two cuts seems reasonable. Now, Bitcoin, let's actually dive into some of these tickers. Look at that charts. Bitcoin continues to balance here. And listen, it did look like it was showing a lot of strength on this way up. But we're putting a huge wick right here. And if it does move lower, this would actually be another lower high. So not very constructive price action here for Bitcoin. I mean, you could look at something like this and say, hey, and we're forming a wedge, making lower lows. And until we actually break above that, that's when you would really look to maybe get long in Bitcoin. We look at something like gold. Again, not much is happening at all. These are the key levels you can look at. Same with silver. They were both down. So commodities did take it on the chin. Same thing here with oil continues to make another lower low at the $78 range, but it does look like a bottom is forming. So we probably might see a little bit of upbeat action here in oil, maybe to the $80 range, and then we'll go from there. And then the dollar did push up ever so slightly. Wow, look at that bounce off the dollar in the last couple of days. Totally missed that, but the, the, the dollar gaining a bit and, you know, that's not going to help. Uh, equities as a whole. But with the fact that rates are coming down, yields are coming down, that's probably more of a factor towards equities than it is a, a slightly stronger dollar. And, you know, the dollar is weaker from the start of May to where it is right now. But let's dive into the S&P 500 more exclusively, guys. 5200, we were going to find very, very strong resistance here in the 5200 area. And it was very simple why um, that was going to happen, simply because 5200 is the core gamma resistance zone. So we we're going to find uh, resistance right here, move all the way down. And I said, as long as we stay above the 5100 mark, we're good to go uh, bounce, move higher, you know, and go break all time high. So I do expect some form of a pullback here in the next couple of days, especially towards the end of the week, close above this high, and then we'll continue um, you know, the movement to all time highs here in the S&P 500. And I'm not saying we're going to find support at 5,100. We can find support anywhere in this period right here. I'm just saying that, you know, between now and 5,100, we're probably going to find support in this area to continue the move higher. This does look constructive to move higher. If the bears, if this was really a fake out, I think the market probably would have stopped us at the tracks here, taken us lower, made a lower low, but that's simply not the case. You know, we put in a very bullish candle right here. And the reason why this doesn't look constructive, it looks like a shooting star is because it's at the core gamma resistance and we are going to find a bit of resistance here. But I do think that it's going to be very short lived uh, towards the end of this week into early next week. And then we are going to continue uh, the move up to all time highs. We're just way too close to these all time highs to not go and break them. Uh, the market generally does go and break all time highs. I saw stats like when you're 1% from all time highs, 99% uh, of the time you go ahead and break those all time highs within, I believe, a 14 day period. The stats are on the side of the bulls. Uh, I wouldn't really fight the tape. There's not much to say. We've run up a lot. Uh, look for some downside action to the 5100 area. I wouldn't take off exposure. I wouldn't enter any shorts. We're just going to see a bit of a short term pullback in my personal opinion. Find support anywhere between 5,200, 5,100, and then continue the move higher. And yeah, that's all I'm seeing, guys. I think we're going to find a bit of resistance here at the 5,200 area. Find support anywhere from 51 to 5,200, and then we move higher. Now, all of this does change if the core gamma resistance moves to 5,300. If the core gamma resistance moves up to this 5,300 area, right here, we 100% can just break these highs and rally. But until that actually happens, as long as this call gamma resistance is at 5,200, do expect a bit of weakness right here, but do expect us to find support and then continue the move higher in the S&P 500. Now guys, we have a pretty light week of data. We do have quite a number of Fed speakers coming out to speak, but generally speaking, it's a light week of data and a fairly light week of earnings. A lot more on the hyper growth and growth names more than it is these large mega caps that can really take the market off course. And you can see right here that no new News is actually good news. Uneventful macro weeks are actually the best weeks for stocks. This is the median weekly return based on the number of key macro data releases during the week 0, 1, 2, and 3. And in weeks when we have zero key macro releases, we normally return 0.62%, besting second place by more than double. And in weeks like these, you just want to be long and take all the gains that come, accept them because we do know that the weeks ahead are going to get volatile. That being said, favor is on the side of the bulls. And and no news is often good news for stocks. Now let's actually talk about earnings. So the week is really getting going with earnings. We had Disney, Nikola Celsius before the bell. And then after the bell here, we had Rivian, Lyft, Oxy, Upstart. And today we're going to cover Disney and Celsius. Okay, looking at earnings, guys, Disney earnings. So they beat here on EPS of $1.21. The expectation was 
uh, $1.11, but they missed on sales of $22.08 billion. We were expecting $22.12. Management guided for 25% EPS growth. The reason why the stock was down, what, 7 8% had to do with their Disney Plus subscribers. Uh, they actually grew their subscribers 6 million quarter of a quarter, but the street was expecting a little bit more than that. And that probably goes to the narrative that maybe some of these other streaming services are taking market share from Disney, especially when you have Netflix, which was supposed to report 6 million subscribers for their quarter, reported 9 million. And that's why Netflix was up 1.51% today, why Disney was down a lot. The market doesn't like to see that type of stuff, especially when you look at the streaming component of Disney, which is their high margin business. But other than that, the earnings report was great. It was a really good earnings report. They did $8 billion in free cash flow, uh, very close to their record. I think their record is like 8.8, 8.9, somewhere around there. So this company is generating a lot of cash right now. You know, at the end of the day, you have to look at it as still growing their Disney Plus subscribers by 6 million over the quarter. It was sequential growth as well. And I thought the earnings were good, except for that one small part. But the street didn't like the fact that Disney Plus didn't come in line. They did miss on revenue. And when you miss on very key metrics, you are going to get sold off. The market just doesn't like that. Looking at Celsius holding, same thing here to Disney. Same thing here to Disney. They missed on sales. Beat on EPS, $27 EPS on sales of $356 million. The street were expecting $319 million. And the reason they missed was due to inventory movements within their largest distributor, where Q1 2024 inventory days on hand declined versus Q4. And that could be because of a number of reasons. It could be because of uh, shipping freight. It could be because of manufacturing. It could be because of materials or lack thereof. But other than that, everything in this earnings report was great. The reason why the stock in the pre-market was down 16% had to do with this. The reason why at the close it was only down 1% had to do with everything else. This company is expanding margins. They're growing rapidly. They have such a huge base to grow into for the rest of the world. I mean, they showed a map of every single country where they were selling drinks and it was it was pretty much just like the united states and then small parts of europe they have all of asia to expand into all of the southeast asia they have all of africa they have all of south america this company has a huge runway for growth and that is why investors bought the dip just looking at the earnings scorecard this is blended earnings growth right here for the s p 500 guys we are doing really really well you can actually see here the q1 eps is tracking slightly above consensus estimates now, at the start of earnings season, consensus was 3.5%. The S&P 500 is now reporting 7.1% earnings. And you can see here that this right here is earnings revisions to the first quarter Q1 EPS. And we are tracking well above trend. And that coincides with the fact that earnings have just come in quite stellar, to be honest. Really, really good. According to this data right here, we're tracking at about $56 quarterly earnings here for the S&P 500. Now, guys, revisions continue to move up. This is next 12 months earnings per share. Revisions, they continue to just march higher, which is absolutely crazy, sitting at $254 in earnings per share. That would put the current PE multiple at about 20 times, a little bit over 20. And then margins also continue to move higher. This is the forward 12 months profit margins. And you can actually see they are sitting right now at 13%. Just for record, margins right now are sitting at about 12.4%. So it does look like in the next 12 months, margins are expected to expand. And this is often bullish for stocks. Guys, in an environment where earnings are increasing and margins are expanding, you want to own equity, you want to own stocks, especially when these revisions are moving up in both directions now. And we can actually see right here that we are having upward revisions in the S&P 500. This is the EPS earnings monitor. And this number right here represents the amount of companies having consensus revisions to the upside versus downside. So in the S&P 500 right now, 41 companies for the past week had revisions to the upside for the next 12 months more than they had to the downside. And this is really what you want to see at the at the same time, the change in S&P 500 forward estimates over the last year is only sitting at about 11%. Normally, the average year, we actually see 20% change to the upside or downside in revisions, and we're sitting actually below trend. This is trend right here, and that means that there probably is room for earnings to run higher, and that probably means margins will also run higher. So you definitely want to own equities. You want exposure to equities when earnings are moving higher and margins are expanding, and that's exactly what we're seeing right now here in 2024 not just for the year and now, but for the next 12 months as well. And if you think earnings have peaked and we're likely getting downward revisions from here, both are think differently. This is some commentary and data on the next leg of the earnings cycle. While the earnings recovery so far has been driven by better margins, we believe the next leg of the earnings up cycle will be led by volume growth, real sales growth, which started to improve in the first quarter.
quarter plus 3% versus plus 1% here in the fourth quarter of 2023. Historically, volume growth resulted in margin improvement due to operating leverage. The goods manufacturing economy normalizing versus services could lead to earnings leading GDP going forward. Energy, consumer discretionary, industrials, tech, and materials have historically had big operating leverage. We've had a margin-driven recovery. We're now moving into a demand volume growth recovery, and this is going to be benefit stocks in the energy, consumer discretionary, industrials, and tech sector. And overall, that's going to benefit the S&P 500 because we do know that discretionary, technology, and industrials are some of the biggest S&P 500 sectors. Now, with all of this knowledge in hand, what are fund managers buying? Now, we did see net negative equity fund flows last week, negative 1.33 billion here in the S&P 500. And that largely had to do with a lot of the selling we saw midweek. I'm sure that this number was significantly higher heading into Thursday, heading into Friday. However, what exactly were fund managers buying last week? The biggest thing they were buying were MLPs, which is pretty much energy, a little bit of utilities, but pretty much just energy. They were also buying financials, Japan, bank loans, and they were buying growth as well, materials, municipal bonds, value, and REITs. Now, out of all of this, excluding growth, right, and maybe Japan, what is the common thing? theme above all of these. Very, very simple. It's value names as well as bonds. This is what the bigger players, both as private clients, are currently buying. They're buying value and they're buying bonds. They're buying credit. And I mean, let's be honest, Japan, you could say is value. I mean, it's trading right now at 15 times forward earnings. And what are the big boys selling? Well, they're selling healthcare, utilities, tips, yields. Okay. Especially if inflation is coming down, you definitely don't want to hold tips. You want to hold munis and you want to hold investment grade. However, investment grade did see minor outflows along with energy, dividend payers, high yield and emerging market debt. So definitely value and then nominal bonds is really where the big money is putting their money to play last week. Now, guys, we're going to look at a couple of economic indicators and a couple of indicators that are not looking too good. The first one is the economic surprise index. And this is the United States, China and Eurozone, as well as the global economic surprise index. And you can see the U.S. economic surprise index is the most negative here since February 2023. This is when we just started coming out of the cost of living crisis. This was the worst of it towards the end of 2022, start of 2023. And then the U.S. economy had an amazing recovery. Now we have been trending lower and often when we do break the zero line, this could be a precursor to us potentially having weaker economic data in the future. And if we have weaker data with this persistently higher inflation, that is going to build on the stagflation environment. And that's not going to be good for yields. That's not going to be good for the stock market, but it's going to be good for commodities. And there will be other asset classes we will talk about. But for now, it's nothing to worry about, but it is something that we do need to pay attention to, particularly some key economic data points. We want to look at the labor market, GDP, GDI, consumption, the consumer and how everything's holding in there. And if you go ahead, follow me, you'll never miss a beat because we do cover all of those indicators. Now, one of those indicators is actually the THS jobs. This right here is temporary help services, THS jobs, this blue line right here, and this red line, it's actually real GDP. Now, declines in THS jobs are often considered a leading indicator for potential recessions. You can see here that when THS goes below this line right here, it often coincides with the recession. You can see these gray lines right here is the recession. And this is where we are right now. Um, um, we have crossed below the zero line. We are in deep contraction territory. However, THS jobs are recovering. That being said, this indicator, often considered a leading indicator for a recession, could be pointing to a recession here in 2024, maybe late 2024, 2025. Now, at the same time, another indicator we need to be aware of that's a little bit concerning is the spread between the US ISM new orders and inventories. Essentially, they do not suggest a promising upward trend in the ISM manufacturing PMI as new orders are decreasing at a fast faster pace than inventories. The reason why this right here isn't necessarily a good thing because it means that demand is decreasing, there's a buildup in inventory, and that business confidence uh, could be waning as we head into the rest of 2024. So we're going to keep a keen eye on the ISM PMI numbers looking forward. They did come in soft last week. That did help the inflation narrative. That's part of the reason why stocks rallied along with Jerome Powell, but softer PMIs did help industrial sector and the rate cut narrative for the most part. So looking at gamma guys, we have seen a huge amount of positive gamma form into the tape. Not surprising at all. 5,200 is still this call gamma resistance. And then we still have these big strikes at 53, 54, 5250 as well, building out right here, particularly this 5300 strike. 
very very big strike when you look at it in aggregate we can also see right here 5000 remains to put support a lot of negative gamma has rolled off and that was just after yesterday's price action we could see that there's a huge amount of volume here in the 5200 5100 area other than that guys it's still buy dip sell rips but the gamma flip has moved from about 51 to 5125 that's often a bullish indicator we still have this very tiny amount of positive gamma here at the 5000 tape so someone is playing deep in the money calls or he's deep in the profit either way the regime remains positive and that means we want to be buyers of dips sellers of rips all the way to 5200 now what the bulls want is just for this strike to move up that's what you really want to see you want to see the strike move up here to the 5300 strike if that can happen bob's your uncle and then we probably make our way to 5300 by opex but as it is right now this is a very very big strike it seems and i do think we're probably going to stay here into may but may opex is still a while away it's on the 17th we'll see how this unfolds that being said you have everything you need right here buy dip sell rips look to 5200 as the main zone and we will find strong resistance at the 5200 area otherwise 5125 we can see quite a bit of downside volatility but i'm still convicted on the fact that at 5100 5000 bulls will come in and find support particularly here at this 5000 level now guys let's tackle market breath this is percentage of stocks at one month highs uh, for the s p 500 400 600 so large mids smalls and we can see a huge Huge, huge improvement particularly in these smaller names compared to the s p 500 and normally the s p 500 leads the pack and now we're seeing small caps and mid caps actually kind of leading this recovery to the upside here in the overall market this is very very bullish and i particularly want to pay attention to mid caps because they're exhibiting a lot of strength i mean excluding energy look at these numbers percentage of stocks at 10 day highs and 20 day highs and this is really really constructive because it starts with the 10 day highs it moves over to the 20 day highs and it moves over to the three month highs and we're starting to see up before here in utilities which can be a bit concerning but also in stuff like com services and if you actually dive a bit deeper look at stuff like financials healthcare industrials technology they're also exhibiting a lot of strength and this type of breath momentum is indicative of coming off a low and it's exactly what you want to see after a pullback risk is skewed to the upside and remember guys momentum brings momentum looking at our longer term risk on risk off indicator or the roro you can see that in this five percent five to seven percent pullback we had in the s p 500 we actually never dipped into risk off territory it was always just risk on and this just meant that this five percent pullback was just an opportunity for you guys to just add exposure and for those of you that did you're sitting very pretty on your gains right now looking at the bull market behavior checklist by the way, I didn't show you guys this in the last couple of weeks. This got to as low as five out of nine. But we are sitting at seven out of nine right now and percentage of global markets above their 50 day moving average. By the way, this is going to tick up to yes, very, very soon. It's currently at 67.4. If we have another fairly green day in the broader market as a whole, we should see this tick up and have eight out of nine as well as the net new high advanced decline line. Currently, you want to see this falling. This is currently rising. So this is the only no. We are yes on every other indicator here. This is about to kick up, but everything is looking very, very strong here in this bull market. And generally speaking, when you get to five out of nine, that's when you want to get worried. We got to five and then the checklist continued higher. So everything is looking still very strong in this bull market. This right here is the global 10 year bond yield composite. It just includes all of these countries. And we can see that across the board in the 10 year, we're finding resistance at this very, very key level where we found resistance a multitude of times. We actually did break above it, call it a fake out and then come down. We're finding resistance here. We did peak above it just a tad, and now we're pulling into the 200 day moving average. And if we break the 200 day, there's a lot of confluence happening right here with the 10 year yield. And we should see this move lower, coupled with a lot of the macro drivers we're seeing in the market in terms of federal banks and their willingness to cut rates, as well as easier monetary policy. We should see the 10 year bond yield continue to move lower. And I actually am a little bit bullish on long term bonds in the short term, not necessarily in the very long term, but I do think that the longer term bonds, TLT, stuff like IEF, have great asymmetric risk to reward to the upside as yields do come down and we are seeing this on a technical chart but do take it with a grain of salt i hate doing technical analysis on bond yields as a whole now looking at market liquidity global liquidity conditions continue to improve to the upside right here although it is still a net negative for the market as a whole the second we get above this zero line right here then liquidity becomes a net positive so despite in the recovery we have seen we've actually still been in a net negative liquidity environment in other words money is being drawn out 
of the market as a whole, but that is set to change in the next few days. And data in the week ahead, guys, we do know that there's not a lot of data here this week, but we do have a couple of Fed speakers still having to speak. Williams, Kashkari, pay attention to him, and then Goolsby. Those are the main ones you really want to be looking at because they do tend to come out hawkish. And if they come out on a dovish tilt, we're going to see the markets continue this momentum we're seeing to the upside. But if you've made it up until here, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, like this video, guys, and leave a comment for the algorithm. Cheers.